this webinar. I am uh, excited to uh, be able to uh, communicate in this time, um, even though I would prefer to be meeting uh, you guys all in person and being at a, an exciting locale. Currently, I'm in Ann Arbor and it's sort of raining. Um, not sort of raining, it's definitely raining. Um, very springtime here. So anyway, and of course, thanks Kelly um, for this. This is a, a great way of, of sharing science. So anyway, I'm looking forward to getting through this uh, information with you guys and then um, hopefully definitely having time to answer questions, which is really actually my favorite part about this whole thing. And you guys may have seen on Twitter that I have a, a, a bulldog puppy and she's currently sniffing my feet. Um, so she may be able to make appearance uh, during this question and answer period. Um, I also have a six-year-old boxer who is snoring uh, behind me. We'll see if we can involve him too. All right, here we go. So we're talking about genomics today. And um, we get some critiques in genomics, uh, as we should. Um, and I kind of want to go through some of the major critiques of genomics. So because I know I'm, I'm uh, not everyone on this call is a genomics person. So um, this is, the, this is some, some complaints that we've heard. And I hope that by going through some of the data, especially in our field, in hemostasis and coagulation, um, that some of these critiques um, we can sort of contrast. Because uh, I think, um, although we have a lot more to learn, I think genomics has been uniquely successful exploring um, our field. And it has, probably has a lot to do with how evolution has sort of tuned the importance of not bleeding to death when you're having a baby or when you're attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. We can, we can think about that over beer, but um, I, I really do feel like the, the particular applications of genomic tools in hemostasis and thrombosis has been super successful. So anyway, so some critiques are we've spent a lot of money on these, on these stud studies. We haven't learned anything that we didn't already know. Another one is all these signals from GWAS are so small and they're not helping us make clinical decisions or leading to you know, this precision medicine, which everyone has talked about in the past and currently. Um, and then if a causal mutation only occurs once in 10,000 people, how could it possibly be useful to my patients? And then finally, I study this protein in my lab. I know it's super important in thrombosis. So why doesn't it show up in the VTE GWAS? All right, so all these things are super valid, but most of them um, I think we can address with, uh, with the experience we've had over the last 10 years and with some data. So let's get to it. So I see genomics really as uh, discovery tools. Um, I won't talk about them in the context of precision medicine, but because I think that although that is the ultimate goal, I think we have a super long way to go there. Um, but I do think that it's much more convincing to show you guys the, the signals that we've generated from these uh, genomic studies and then show you how they've led to interesting biology, um, which was unclear um, that that was going to, to actually happen. So anyway, um, the advantages of genomics, I think, are you have this um, nice unbiased genotype-phenotype associations where you're looking across the entire coding and non-coding genome. And um, that really um, is an advantage because um, it avoids some of the statistical pitfalls that you get from single gene associations. And there's some great examples in the area of venous thromboembolic disease um, that I will briefly highlight later. Um, the other thing is that when you look at the entire genome and you get association signals that you connect genotypes to phenotypes, you also understand the context of uh, these signals compared to all the other negatives in the genome. So it really helps you sort of in your mind rank how, how these signals and their strength are playing in a population in, in the context of each other. And of course, the reason we do this as a discovery tool is that we're hoping that it leads to some unanticipated signals and we learn some new biology. There are disadvantages, of course. This is an expensive thing. It's a lot, lot less uh, expensive now than it used to be, but um, it, it requires large cohorts of people. Genotyping and sequencing um, costs are very high. It's a group science. Uh, it means that you can't just be running your own little lab um, and do it by yourself. You need computational geneticists. You need to teach people about your biology. They need to teach you about the genomics tools. It's complicated. And of course, there was a lot of hype um, initially uh, about how we were going to figure out everything through human genomics. And of course, now that is buffered by reality. So don't get too grumpy. 
because there's some good discoveries to talk about. All right, so um, for this talk today, um, I'm gonna divide it up um, based on bas basically allele frequency. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of background about um, what complex genetic traits are and a little bit of vocab so that um, we're speaking the same language here. Then I'll talk about um, uh, quantitative traits that we've studied by GWAS, in particular VWF, because I think it, not only do I know a lot about it, because um, it's been an area of interest for me, but um, I think it, it demonstrates a lot of the qualities uh, and really informs some of the um, venous thromboembolic disease um, common variant studies, which we will talk about after that. And then we'll um, get to some of the work that I've done with my group um, more recently uh, with some rare variant studies uh, of venous thromboembolic disease and what we're hoping to do with the things that we found uh, in the future, briefly. Okay, so. Here we go. Genetics, genomics 101. I'm going to be brief. Um, first of all, um, classically, uh, we've discovered a lot of genes in the genome by studying families where these diseases run um, uh, with high penetrance. And so these are typically monogenic um, traits, meaning that if you have a mutation uh, in one gene, you develop a phenotype. Um, some classic examples of this in our field are sickle cell disease. It's the same mutation for everyone with sickle cell disease hemophilia A and B and C, and then of course uh, von Willebrand's disease type 3 is typically a loss of function of the VWF gene um, in a homozygous state. Um, however, if you really think about monogenic and Mendelian um, traits, um, and you understand that there's this variance to them, um, which is called a, a variance in expressivity, meaning the, the people with the same mutation can have vastly different um, severity of their disease. And penetrance, meaning that you can have that mutation, and you maybe even have it in your family, but your sibling uh, who has the mutation uh, has the disease and you don't. And so there's some really interesting things, which really kind of makes me think that, and others, that all these Mendelian or monogenic traits are truly more like complex genetic traits. So there's nothing, nothing completely without influence of environment and other genes. So, Complex genetic traits, however, are classically those ones that don't have this predominant effect of a single gene. So things like uh, thrombophilia, which we'll be talking about today, Crohn's disease, lupus, diabetes, really common human um, disease conditions are, um, have a heritable component, and the, the heritable component is typically made up of several different genes, many uh, maybe hundreds. Um, there's environmental factors, and then there's the epistasis, which means that these genes are interacting with each other in context, meaning if you may not, uh, a, a certain variant may not be important unless a different variant and a different gene is uh, present in your uh, background. And then, of course, uh, certain environmental factors bring out um, specific uh, gene uh, uh, effects. Okay, so getting a little bit more specific, um, Understanding things like locus heterogeneity is important. This is just a, a fancy way of saying there are multiple genes that uh, are associated with a specific phenotype. Um, so locus is where the gene is. And so if you have several different genes, you have locus heterogeneity. And then allelic heterogeneity is a little bit more difficult to understand. Um, it's the idea that at a certain gene, you can have multiple different variants uh, affecting um, the trait. So uh, so there's no allelic heterogeneity in sickle cell disease because it's all the same mutation. But um, let's say um, the thalassemias, um, you have several different variants um, at the same globin locus that causes the disease. So that would be an, an example of allelic heterogeneity. And then finally, you know, um, all these variants are inherited in these ancestral blocks called haplotypes. And this is important because we use this pattern that we observe in humans to figure out um, if we know a variant at one position in a haplotype block, then we actually know the variant in another position, and that's called imputation. Um, and that's been an important way of increasing power in these genomic studies, especially for common variants. Okay, so how does the GWAS work? This is old, but um, the, the basic idea is what we're trying to, we, we phenotype a population of people and we genotype them. And then we look to see if the distribution of genotypes is very much related to the presence or absence of a phenotype. And in quantitative traits, that means are there specific uh, genotypes that are more likely or less likely to be present when you have a high level of a protein or a low level of a protein, if that's the quantitative trait you're 
you're studying. So this is just a, a little bit of diagram to sort of um, uh, to, to show you how the, what we're really looking at is a different distribution of uh, these common variants in a population. And we do simple um, statistical tests to say, that, is this variant more likely to be in cases or controls? And what's the p-value? And the common readout for GWAS is this Manhattan plot. I'm gonna use my laser pointer. There we go. So this, this is a, a, um, a Manhattan plot where you have, um, a generation of uh, a signal. These are each dot represents a SNP test, and the p-value um, is reported here. So the higher here, because it's a negative log p-value, the lower the um, the p-value, and the stronger the association. Um, and the fancy thing about GWAS is that it's typically additive. So if you do multiple studies, um, you're able to actually increase your power to detect uh, uh, lower effect size associations. So here's an example of a, uh, that initial study, and when you add two more studies later, you get stronger and stronger signals. Great, okay. So all of this um, test that we do in genomics are based on the allele frequency, and so this is gonna be a recurrent theme today. Um, with common um, variants in our population, those um, common variants are there because they occurred a long time ago and they've been preserved in our population. So, um, you shouldn't be surprised that a variant that's been in a, a population for a long time is not bad for you because evolution has a way of getting rid of the variants that are causing bad disease or fitness uh, problems. However, the ones that occur more recently in our population um, haven't had time to be selected against and they typically will have har uh, larger effect sizes. However, those more recent variants are less common in the population and they won't be captured by imputation or direct SNP genotyping um, or in GWAS in general. And so we have to rely on things like whole genome sequencing um, or whole exome sequencing um, to capture those newer variants and see um, how they're affecting the traits that we're interested in. Okay, so this was a super cool um, example of what I just showed you. Uh, this is actually empirical evidence. I had nothing to do with the study, but I think it's awesome. This is where a, a group did um, uh, 1,500 uh, different GWASs for plasma proteins. So I'm interested in plasma proteins. Um, they had a relatively small cohort. This is 3,000 people. But here you see that the um, each dot here is basically a, a locus uh, that they've associated with these uh, 1,478 different uh, GWASs they did. Um, and I want to show you that, uh, so in the, in the red are cis um, associations, and cis associations are when, let, let's say you're measuring von Willebrand factor, and you get a signal at von Willebrand factor, that's a cis association. Um, but however, uh, a trans association is when you measure von Willebrand factor and you get an association at ABO, that would be, you know, an association with a gene that's not the gene encoding the protein that you're measuring. So anyway, so you see this interesting pattern where as your uh, minor allele frequency decreases, at the very ends of um, detectable for GWAS, as you see this spike uh, in effect size. And so um, this is just sort of empiric evidence of the idea that the, the, the less common a variant is in a population, the, the higher effect on the uh, size on the phenotype it will have. And you can also see that you can't really go down to really low frequency levels because GWAS um, isn't able to capture that data. So, and I, I'll hopefully convince you of uh, the, uh, the way, the, a couple different tools that can capture those rare variants together and find high effect size uh, variants. Okay, so let's start talking about specific data, um, something that I, my group has actually done. Uh, and, um, and we'll see, so I'm gonna talk about VWF. Um, a lot of you know about VWF and Factor VIII, um, that they're central mediators of hemostasis. Um, so this is a large gene, and it has multiple different functional domains. Um, it's produced in endothelial cells and mycocaryocytes, and um, has uh, this, the specific functional domains include um, uh, the ability to interact with subendothelial collagen um, through its A3 domain interactions. Um, it also interacts with platelets through its A1 domain. Um, I didn't mention it here, but the, uh, it interacts with a cleaving protease in its A2 domain, Adam TS13. Um, and it's uh, a multimeric protein. I'm sorry, it's also a carrier for factor eight in circulation and without 
von Willebrand factor around, you don't get uh, factor eight, uh, significant factor eight levels. It's a multimeric protein, so um, it dimerizes uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum, and then it multiplies in the post-Golgi uh, compartment where it's stored in these secretory vesicles and secreted into circulation. And in that process, the propeptide domain is actually cleaved off and gets secreted with VWF. Um, and so the, the other thing to mention is that the longer the VWF is, the more procoagulant it is, and the higher antigen levels you are, which has nothing to do with actual the, the length of the multimer, um, the more procoagulant you are. Okay, so Evan Sadler had this great diagram that I use in almost every talk because it demonstrates how as uh, von Willebrand factor levels vary in a population, the risk for bleeding and thrombosis are affected. So at the very low levels of von Willebrand factor, um, concentrations, you have an increased risk of bleeding, and you're much more likely to be diagnosed with von Willebrand disease um, or have a, a mutation in your von Willebrand factor gene that um, decreases its function. On the flip side, um, as your von Willebrand factor levels increase, the risk for um, venous thrombosis increases. So this is a pattern that we've known for a long time and makes it a very interesting protein. Okay, so um, we started um, being very interested in studying this in human populations and using the new genotyping technology. And while we were uh, assembling our, our study, um, the group uh, from the uh, NHLBI charges, uh, the Charge Association group, um, uh, published this great paper on factor eight and von Willebrand factor levels. Um, and so this is a study where they um, put together in a meta-analysis 24,000 uh, adults and we're able to find strong signals uh, associated with the variance in von Willebrand factor levels. And the reason I'm showing both of these um, plots here is that you can see that um, factor eight really and, and von Willebrand factor, their genetic associations are super similar. The top two signals here, we're talking about, remember I mentioned before the context, you can see how strong the signal is at, uh, in association with the trait. Um, well, ABO is the big one, um, and uh, von Willebrand factor was the second strongest uh, locus here. So again, variance here at ABO um, for both factor eight and von Willebrand factor um, are primary uh, associations with uh, levels in the plasma. And so uh, if you look at this a little bit more closely, you found that the, the SNPs here, um, not only are, is there locus heterogeneity, meaning there's a lot of different signals across the genome, but there's also allelic heterogeneity in that the signals, the SNPs that you found associated with von Willebrand factor levels here define the four major ABO haplotypes that we knew about. Those are A, type A, type B, and O, as well as the A2 um, allele, which is a sort of hypomorphic A allele. Um, so that, that had already been known. Um, uh, as far as a critique goes. Um, and of course, you know, no one was surprised that you would find the cis association at the von Willebrand factor locus um, for VWF levels, but this, uh, I guess, should not be surprising either because we knew that factor eight levels largely rely on von Willebrand factor levels. Okay, so this was a super cool study. They found a lot of other um, signals that we're gonna talk about uh, in just a couple minutes. Um, and so, um, like I said, we were um, working on this at the same time um, in a much smaller uh, way. We uh, were doing a sibling study, and uh, right there in the middle is me and my brother in Munich last year, enjoying some um, libations during Oktoberfest. This was a super fun time, and I wish, uh, I, I'm really hoping that it's, uh, uh, COVID goes away and we're able to continue to do these amazing things in public. Um, anyway, so back to my study. Um, we, uh, we started a sibling study, and um, this was like 2008. Um, we collected about 1,100 people. They were all siblings. Um, these were healthy people, um, students and faculty at the University of Michigan, and um, they represented about 507 different families. We genotyped these um, uh, people, uh, participants, um, uh, the latest greatest SNP chip at the time, and have subsequently imputed the data to uh, about 7.7 .7 million different variants in the genome for each person. Um, at the same time, we collaborated with a group in Ireland and at the NHGRI who had a very similar cohort of 2,304 individuals who were genotyped on the same chip, and we've imputed their data as well. So um, like I was talking about earlier, we can use both these groups in, in meta-analysis to increase our power. 
So we characterize the plasma from both these cohorts for lots of different uh, quantitative traits. And um, von Wolleren factor is, of course, the one I'm going to talk about today. But we also looked at the propeptide, Adam TS13, um, and some other coag specific uh, markers um, and fibrinolytic uh, and anticoagulant uh, proteins. So what we found um, wasn't as exciting as the charge uh, analysis because you know we only had the power to detect the top two signals here, so ABO and von Willebrand factor, and these are just zooming in on the specific SNP associations at each locus. Um, because we had siblings in this group, we could do another technique which was a little older, but it's called linkage analysis. Linkage analysis uses the same variant, the SNP data. However, instead of asking if the associations are specific to uh, uh, one SNP, um, you use the SNPs to develop uh, sharing patterns within the family, and you basically map where um, uh, the allele sharing patterns uh, generate a signal um, because either uh, siblings with the same um, or similar uh, von Willebrand factor levels share the same haplotypes or whether they whether they diverge um, there. And so you can basically match the haplotype sharing patterns within families to the uh, von Willebrand factor levels. And um, what we found was a signal on uh, chromosome nine, which is the ABO um, locus. Um, and uh, using some um, techniques uh, with families, uh, with the family structure, we could say that it explained about 24% of the variance in VWF levels. But you may notice that we also found a large signal on chromosome two here. And uh, that explained about 19% of the variance. Um, unfortunately, it was a large linkage interval, and there are about 100 genes there, um, right near the centromere on chromosome two. So we, of course, were uh, interested um, in figuring out what uh, the variants are uh, doing in chromosome two and how they're affecting von Willebrand factor levels. Um, interestingly, people ask me about uh, ask me this all the time. Um, we saw no von Willebrand factor um, signal. Um, at the von Willebrand, no signal at the von Willebrand factor gene uh, in linkage, suggesting that um, there are no clusters of rare variants there um, that were generating a signal that we had a power to detect. Whereas um, this chromosome two signal doesn't show up in the charge um, VWF GWAS nor RGWAS, and um, that really suggests that whatever is driving the signal are um, clusters of variants that have uh, allele frequencies that are too low to be detected in GWAS. Okay, so we were able to, um, we haven't mapped the gene yet, but we were able to detect, a, um, to understand a little bit more about the biology there by looking at von Willebrand factor propeptide. Uh, and uh, as some of you may know, the, the propeptide and the mature uh, von Willebrand factor are secreted at the same time, but they have um, radically different um, half-lives. So uh, the propeptide is cleared rapidly, whereas the half-life of plasma VWF is between eight and 12 hours. And, um, so if you measure and uh, calculate the ratio of propeptide to um, von Willebrand factor, you, you get some information basically on the clearance rates of von Willebrand factor. And so um, not surprisingly, when you compare an individual's propeptide and their von Willebrand factor levels, um, you see some correlation because they are secreted together. Uh, they're uh, transcribed off, uh, translated off the same RNA. And, um, but the, it's not a perfect matchup here. And the correlation is about uh, the row value was 0.53 here. Um, and so um, that just, again, speaks to the fact that they have different clearances. Anyway, we use this um, uh, trick of the ratio to sort of make assumptions about whether these variants were driving von Willebrand factors through clearance, altered clearance, or altered synthesis and secretion. And so if you look at our GWAS again, and then you look at the von Willebrand factor propeptide GWAS, you see that we um, generate much smaller signals at ABO compared to, for the propeptide compared to the uh, mature von Willebrand factor. So that really suggests what we knew, uh, the ABO was driving um, von Willebrand factor uh, plasma um, concentrations through variance in clearance rates. Interestingly, the signal at von Willebrand factor also goes away. And so that suggests that the variants here, instead of uh, causing altered secretion into the circulation, may be actually causing more rapid clearance of von Willebrand factor. And so how does this look for um, linkage? Well, we didn't see the signal on chromosome two for von Willebrand propeptide that we saw for von Willebrand factor. So again, 
using this idea of the ratio, that means that the whatever variants are driving bundle rent factor variation at that chromosome two linkage interval may be operating through altered clearance, um, which may help us, you know, select down our, our gene list. Okay, so remember when I said one of the criticisms is that we just don't learn any biology. Well, if you look at all the different loci that have been um, detected for von Willebrand factor uh, at this point, um, that's a nice list. And um, uh, I, David Lillicrap and Laura Swison did a very nice review in 2018 on this where they showed um, basically that they talked about all the different groups that had um, investigated these signals and uh, discovered some interesting biology. We knew about ABO and you could guess about von Willebrand factor variants, but we learned a lot about um, how uh, the Weibel Pilati um, storage uh, vesicles for von Willebrand factor work and the role of syntax and binding protein 5 in that. Um, we learned about clearance receptors, including uh, SCARA5 and STAB2, um, as well as CLEC4M. Um, these are different clearance receptors that might um, change the uh, the rate that von Willebrand factor is moved from the, removed from circulation. And then there's this ST3GAL4 signal that I'll, I'll show you coming up um, that changes the glycosylation pattern and probably operates similar to ABO in that it um, changes the protection from clearance for von Willebrand factor. So this was the latest, greatest GWAS um, that we contributed data to um, that was published last year. And so the numbers are really high and it's a multi-ethnic um, uh, genome-wide association study, which is great because um, we expect different signals in different ancestries. Um, but here, again, you see these are all the signals that that charge GWAS found initially, and now we're getting some new signals by <laughs> increasing our numbers to uh, extraordinary levels. Um, a couple of them are very interesting, and um, I'm sure we'll get some more functional data about them soon. Interestingly, no signal on chromosome 2, suggesting, again, that despite studying 50,000 people, if you don't have the power to detect any associations below a certain allele frequency, you're gonna miss um, the linkage signal. Or I guess if you're a contrarian, you could say, maybe that linkage signal is complete crap. Who knows? I like to think it's real, but I haven't proven it yet. Okay, so I wanna talk about thrombosis a little bit more. And so now that we've, we've had a chance to dip our feet into the water of von Willebrand factor genome-wide association studies, let's, let's see what um, uh, the, genome-wide association studies for um, venous thrombopolic disease look like. Okay, so VTE is a complex genetic trait. Many of you um, know uh, and have dedicated your careers to understanding this better. Um, there are a lot of environmental factors that are associated with uh, venous thromboembolic disease that are well described. I think, interestingly, we've been thinking about how this increased incidence of um, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism in COVID-19 patients um, works. Um, but I officially listed that as an environmental factor, meaning that um, people who have COVID-19 maybe wouldn't have normally had a DVT, but once they're uh, super sick with COVID-19, they get the DVT. Um, and it may, may not have anything to do with the underlying uh, genetic background. But we also knew a lot about the genetic um, risk factors for um, uh, venous thromboembolic disease pre-GWAS era. And these included the signals that affected von Willebrand factor and factor eight levels, the ABO, um, and factor V Leiden, um, prothrombin 2020. These were um, single uh, SNP associations that had been um, uh, either initially discovered through biochemistry or through genetic studies. And then, of course, um, we knew about families that had rare variants in protein C, protein S, and antithrombin um, that developed a higher risk for venous thromboembolic disease. So that's what we went into this knowing. And the first uh, genome-wide association studies for venous thromboembolic disease started happening in the late 2000s. Um, David uh, Trejouet's group um, published in Blood, uh, finding uh, things that we already knew, basically. Um, and so uh, they studied... Um, looks like 400 VTE cases and 1,000 controls, and we're able to find signals at ABO and Factor V Leiden. Um, John Heights Group also uh, in 2012 published uh, their findings in a cohort from Minnesota that also found signals there. And so um, the conclusion was we need a lot more people to find new signals um, with common variants and venous thromboembolic disease. Um, and so in uh, not in 2105, I think that's 2015. Um, uh, the INVENT Consortium 
um, published their first genome-wide association studies for venous thromboembolic disease and significantly upped the numbers by combining a lot of different cohorts. And they found signals not just at factor V Leiden and ABO, but they found another signal at factor V Leiden. And we start to see some of these other new signals emerge at uh, uh, the fibrinogen gamma locus, the factor 11 lo locus, um, the uh, prothrombin variant, finally they had enough power to, to, to detect, and then uh, the protein C receptor and this SLC44A2 um, signal was generated, as well as this ZFPM2 signal and T-SPAN15. So this was super exciting and again, I think um, provides um, new things for us to study and were unanticipated prior, prior to this genome association study. So to update everybody to 2019, there's been some super big uh, genome-wide association studies for venous thromboembolic disease. So now we're talking 30,000 cases, 172,000 controls, or 26,000 cases and 600,000 controls. And so we're finding, as you can imagine, more signals. Now, I don't think I've emphasized this enough yet, but um, if you have to study 30,000 people to find a signal, that suggests that that signal that's generated um, is probably contributing a very small amount to the overall risk of the disease. And so I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, whether that it, it uh, informs biology, I think, is a completely different question. And um, I will show you some examples of very weak signals that also that have nonetheless contributed to our understanding of um, biology and hemostasis and thrombosis. So here are all the signals. Again, this is mirrored very much in this um, uh, Million Veterans Program GWAS that was published both in 2019. Um, and so I was preparing for this talk and uh, reading some literature last week and I found, I stumbled upon a new um, uh, publication in eLife and I just wanted to highlight um, this as an example of how you can take a very weak signal from this GWAS, again, studied 30,000 people to find it, um, and yet have been able to uh, uncover some potentially very interesting biology. And I haven't had a time to truly dissect this paper, um, but this is from the group at Imperial in London, um, uh, Const Constanescu um, Burku et al. Um, they published um, uh, a very interesting study that basically um, identifies this SLC44A2 receptor as an important neutrophil receptor um, responsible for netosis and probably a uh, contributor to venous thromboembolic disease. And how they did this basically was looking at VWF, how VWF prime platelets subsequently express uh, fibrinogen receptors and can interact um, with that SL. C44A2 receptor on um, neutrophils to contribute to um, netosis. So super interesting connections. And the interesting thing I thought and the fantastic thing about it was that the variant that was present in that VTE GWAS, which is present in about 22% of the popula uh, European population, um, showed a difference in its function. So um, if you have a neutrophil that expresses um, that SLC44A2 variant, um, you have uh, much reduced interactions with platelet, VWF prime platelets and less netosis. So that was a super cool way of going from a VTE GWAS um, to biology that they were studying in lab. I just wanted to highlight it there. So bravo. Okay, what else can we do with GWAS information besides uh, understand biology? Well, and I'm gonna check my time because I tend to babble. All right, I better hurry my butt. Um, so um, actually, you know what, I'm gonna skip this because it's complicated, but um, I just wanna say that you can do statistical stuff with genome-wide association studies. Um, so uh, Mendelian randomization studies are a way of using the signals from a GWAS to basically identify what's causal in a different disease. Um, and I don't, wanna, I don't wanna spend too much time talking about it now, other than to say that um, you can imagine because v VWF levels have been associated with VT in the past, if you do a Mendelian randomization study, you can sh show that the risk for venous thromboembolic disease is greater um, uh, uh, and that VWF is the causal um, change in that population that's driving the venous thromboembolic disease. Happy to talk about uh, this a little bit more. The other thing you can do is develop polygenic risk scores. So this is uh, potentially important in that um, if you have developed a lot of different SNP genotyping associations for von um, venous thromboembolic disease, 
then you might be able to sort of genotype patients and say, hey, based on that data, you have an increased or decreased risk for venous thromboembolic disease. And so um, the idea is that you develop a score and that you identify a group of individuals with much higher risk of the disease based on the SNPs that they've inherited. And these are all um, based on common SNPs, um, again, generated from genome-wide association studies. So we've done this with, v um, not we, um, the, the group Claire and D uh, et al. did this um, uh, for uh, their venous uh, thromboembolic disease, GWAS, and basically developed a risk score and they show um, pretty definitively that their risk score, their polygenic risk score, is about equivalent to the combined effects of Leiden and uh, the prothrombin mutation. And if you combine the two, um, the odds ratio predicting venous thromboembolic disease increase even more. Okay, so I wanna talk about my work. Um, rare variant studies in, in venous thromboembolic disease is something we've been concentrating on um, for the past uh, uh, couple years. Um, and again, the, the reason that you want to look at uh, rare variants is that that data really is not captured uh, in um, uh, the GWAS studies that have been published. Um, also, when we try to look at lower frequency variants by genotyping, we haven't found anything super new. So you really do have to use sequencing. The problem is that our power goes down uh, big time. And so it requires um, uh, sort of uh, statistical tricks to get enough uh, power to um, detect associations when you're looking at rare variants. And this hasn't been uh, uniformly successful across traits. In fact, I would say that what we've been able to find with the venous thromboembolic disease is relatively new um, and an exception. So we used a gene collapsing analysis. And this is the idea where if you count up the number of variants in a um, gene and you look at the distribution between um, qualifying variants in that gene that are rare, um, and you find that they're equally burdened, you don't develop a signal. However, if you look at a gene and you see, okay, the, the people who have the disease that I'm interested in tend to harbor a lot of damaging mutations in that gene, you generate a signal. And so this is the collapsing analysis at the gene level. And so we did this um, um, in a collaboration with uh, some uh, computational biologists and some amazing clinicians at McMaster and at Leiden University. Um, we were able to collect about 400 um, well phenotyped VTE cases and um, perform whole exome sequencing from their DNA and, uh, and collaborating with other um, uh, uh, scientists, we, we found uh, uh, control exomes that we also compared. This was super important um, in that we um, were only able to detect these signals without bias because we, we actually analyzed both the control and the case exomes in the same uh, variant calling pipeline. So anyways, after we, we kind of uh, eliminated and, and cleaned up the data and only looked at very rare variants, these were variants that had a minor allele frequencies below 0.005%, uh, um, um, we were able to actually um, look for genes that were harboring rare mutations in BTE. And incidentally, the, the cases that we looked at um, had a Leiden frequency of about 18.4%, which is very typical for uh, venous thromboembolic disease cohorts. Okay, so this is um, a QQ plot which basically took each gene that we looked at. We looked at 17,000 genes and um, displays what we would expect by these multiple observations versus what we observed in the collapsing analysis. And you see that there's four big dots, uh, four dots that come up at the end there. Um, but the rest of the QQ plot is nice and following expectations, meaning that we weren't systematically decreasing or increasing our ability to find variants. But we find that the, these genes, protein S, protein C, antithrombin, and STAB2 were found. This is what it looks like on a Manhattan plot equivalent where each dot represents a gene that we tested. And we set, um, since we're making 17,000 observations, our, you know, our p-value was somewhere around here for, for significance. Um, but we're pretty sure the protein C and the antithrombin signals that we found were real. But STAB2 was the new finding here. Um, and so STAB2, I wanna talk about briefly. Okay, very briefly. Um, STAB2 is a very interesting gene. It's, a, um, it's known as the haluronin receptor. Um, I'm so happy that I'm talking one day after Aaron talked because um, I had some great ideas uh, listening to his talk about how um, the loss of uh, STAB2 function might actually be contributing to venous thromboembolic disease. I actually hope to talk to Aaron soon about this. 
Um, anyway, so there's uh, unfortunately not a lot known about this STAB2 receptor other than uh, it has some very um, uh, well-described uh, ligands uh, that it clears from the plasma and sends them to the lysosome, basically. It gobbles up haluronin, it gobbles, gobbles up chondroitin sulfate, heparin sulfate, and keratin sulfate. It also has uh, had some uh, literature suggesting that PS exposed cell membranes are removed from circulation by the receptor and that glycosylated um, uh, uh, plasma proteins are removed, including von Willebrand factor. So this was a signal in the von Willebrand factor GWASs. It was not a signal in the VTE GWAS, but it was a signal in our rare variant GWAS. Okay, I'm gonna go through this. So um, we found actually a fair amount of uh, variants uh, in STAB2 in cases and controls. And um, there didn't seem to be any clustering in the fu known functional domains of this large uh, protein uh, when you compare cases and controls. Um, we did some microscopy when we stably um, expressed this receptor in cell culture. You see that the signal for um, the STAB2 is much stronger intracellularly than it is extracellularly. So this is intracellular, different antibody, um, but um, much more uh, suggesting that, that most of this receptor is actually in the intracellular compartment, um, but tends to cluster on the surface of uh, cells that are expressing it. We went on to examine some of the variants that we found in our um, uh, whole exome sequencing study to basically try to figure out how, um, how these missense variants, which are very hard to predict the function of, um, how they were um, playing a role in venous thromboembolic disease risk. So we weren't able to look at all the mutations that we found, but we in general, um, but we, we selected them based on um, whether they were compound heterozygous in people uh, or whether they were found in more than one case. We found this general pattern by flow cytometry looking at the surface expression of STAB2 that compared to reference STAB2, so that's wild type. I don't really like to call wild type uh, uh, people uh, <laughs> being wild type. Um, rather use that because uh, we're all different. Um, and uh, so I just use the reference sequence here um, and compare it to, the, to the, the mutants that we studied. They seem to have less um, fluorescence on the cell surface of stab, with STAB2. Um, expression. Another way of looking at this is in uh, uh, cell culture. On uh, We did this technique called on-cell western, where you use an antib uh, antibody to, to look at the uh, cell surface expression. And we see a very similar pattern there, where reference um, STAB2 is set at 100. And we see, in generally, a decreased um, expression of STAB2 on the cell surface in these missense variants, suggesting that it can't do its job because it's not at the cell surface interacting with ligands in the plasma and um, not able to remove those ligands from the plasma. So if they can't get up to the cell surface, what do they do? Well, it looks like they sit in the endoplasmic reticulum. They don't get through the Golgi. We did an endo-H digestion assay, which showed that um, most of the uh, uh, missense variants um, had um, more endo-H resistance and so weren't getting through the Golgi. Okay. We've also looked at an independent population um, where we use the same criteria in our um, exome sequencing to define um, uh, qualifying variants. So these are very low frequency variants that look nasty. Um, and then we looked in the Twins UK population where, where I'd previously measured von Willebrand factor levels in order to tr try to map that chromosome two linkage interval. So what we found here is that if you looked at von Willebrand factor levels in individuals who had one mutation in STAB2 that qualified, that as a group, they had higher von Willebrand factor levels than the controls. And when you looked at the propeptide, you didn't see that difference, which is consistent with a loss of function of STAB2 that functions as a clearance receptor for von Willebrand factor. I also wanna mention the work that um, David Lillicrap and Laura Swyston, and especially Allison Michaels, a medical student at Queens, um, performed uh, with the STAB2 deficient model, where they, they did this very complicated um, venous um, um, IVC um, stenosis model of DVT. And they showed basically in litter mates that um, the STAB2 wild types had uh, smaller thrombi than the STAB2 um, homozygote negatives. And this is um, illustrated quite nicely here, where you see in this allylic series that if you are deficient in STAB2, you tend to have larger thrombi. Um, I'm hoping that their manuscript on this, um, which contains a lot more data, is going to be published soon too. Okay, so um, in the interest of time, I wanna get uh, time to answer questions. I'm not gonna summarize what I just told you. 
Um, but I will say that um, our lab is currently working on trying to further tease out um, what's going on with this uh, stibilin tube. Um, one of our strategies, and this is the, the work of a postdoc in my lab, um, named Mary Underwood. She um, is working on creating a system where we make a stibilin tube fusion protein on stably expressing uh, 293 cells. And this fusion protein uh, contains a, um, a beer A variant that um, causes um, proteins that localize to the receptor to be labeled by free radical biotin. And that will allow us to um, selectively label um, plasma ligands, we hope, that interact with STAB2 specifically and identify them through mass spectrometry after uh, enriching them through streptavidin pull downs. So we're, we're really excited about what, what information we're going to generate there and how haluronin might actually play a role uh, in altering the ligand binding uh, of these different pla these potential pla plasma ligands. So we would expect to find von Willebrand factor here, um, but hopefully we're going to find other propagandons. Because the other thing is that I didn't mention is that um, the mice model of STAB2 deficiency is interesting because you do see larger thrombi, but if you look at the endogenous VWF levels in those mice, they don't differ based on STAB2 deficiency. So yet they generate larger thrombi. So something else is probably uh, going on in these mice and in probably in humans that's not just a von Willebrand factor um, change that's driving thrombosis risk here. The other thing is that we're starting to dabble in the world of saturation mutagenesis. Um, um, we have a graduate student in the lab who's going to be uh, named Chris Bidlack, who's going to be working on um, developing a library of all possible uh, missense variants and antithrombin and um, selectively sorting these, uh, uh, these cells to determine whether um, the missense variants cause retention within the cell or they cause some functional change in the way antithrombin is interacting and inhibiting 10A and thrombin and other um, and binding heparin. So we're super excited about um, uh, those experiments coming up. All right, so a lot of people to thank. Um, and I, I think I mentioned most of them during this, um, this presentation, so I, I won't spend too much time. Clive Kieran um, and Patricia Law helped get samples from McMaster University for the VTE sequencing. And Peter Reitzma at Leiden University contributed some samples as well. My main statistical colleague is um, Bilge Ozel, um, and my lab managers, Krista Golden, they were responsible for, well, Bill Gay was responsible for most of the GWAS and the VTE um, statistical uh, computational genetics. And Krista, of course, uh, um, is my lab manager and she was responsible uh, and helpful at generating a lot of the data on the functional um, uh, STAB2 missense mutations. Okay, so, and finally, of course, I wanna say to Kelly that you are essential uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak at the seminar series. All done. Oh my God. I don't think I ever blush, but I feel like <laughs> I'm blushing. Gotta love the bitmoji, right? Oh, I feel, I feel a little emotional. Thank you. <laughs> Woo um, also, I want to tell you that I am not a fan of genetics. I don't understand it at all. And I totally understood that. Oh, so I really appreciate you going through all. I always like pretend I know what those words mean. <laughs> we'll say that because I don't want to sound stupid, but I don't really know. Like happily, I, like I don't know what any of that means, but now I kind of do. Okay, I'm I'm glad, and I hope um, you're joined by other listeners. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we. I'm have trying to, to unshare my screen here. Um. So there should be something on top that says stop share. Yeah. It's weird. It's like I can't click it. Maybe if I get out of my PowerPoint. Like, does your Bitmoji look like you or Brad Pitt? We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. There you go. Okay. We have some questions already. Um, don't be shy. Um, I can read them to you. No, I can look at them too. Okay. okay. Jamie oh, Brown. Jamie O'Sullivan. All the way from Ireland, okay. Hi, Jamie. Can you see that? Okay, so can you comment on why Adam TS13 locus, chromosome nine, close to ABO locus, is never observed in GWAS's examine for VWF variation? Is it just due to allele frequency? Thanks, okay. Um, great question. Um, so the, 
the weird thing is, yeah, so Adam T, for those who don't know, Adam TS13 is very close to ABO. And so when you have this huge big signal at ABO, the question is, um, is that hiding Adam TS13's contribution? You would expect that, you know, variance in Adam TS13 might alter the total antigen levels of VWF. Like if you have a, um, an Adam TS13 variant that doesn't cleave von Willebrand factor that well, and of course this is, um, uh, there's been uh, you know studies showing that um, Adam TS13 variants um, or variants in VWF glycosylation can alter Adam TS13 activity. So you'd expect some interaction there. Um, when we looked at it, um, we were able to basically determine that all the SNPs that were significant in Adam TS13 or near Adam TS13 were actually directly linked to ABO, and so they were part of the ABO haplotype signal and not specific to Adam TS13. So yeah, it, it certainly could be that there's a variant in Adam TS13 that um, does drive VWF uh, level variation, but the allele frequency is just too small. So we're, we're actually hoping that um, something similar to what we did with exome sequencing in VTE gets done soon in a von Willebrand factor, and so some rare variant analysis has come out. I wouldn't be surprised if Adam TS13 shows up there. Cool. And there's Paul Bray saying, thanks for the cool eLife reference. My pleasure. If I can't do great science myself, I can highlight other people's science. <laughs> I mean, hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, Blair Gage. Is your interest in Stabilin 2 hampered by any differences between human and mouse STAB 2s? Um, yeah, and also does the STAB 2 expressing cell type matter? Do you need human l sex? Great question. So um, David Lillicrap's group um, has studied um, STAB2 deficiency in mice and in their LSEX um, and has pretty much shown that um, the cells expressing, so I didn't, unfortunately, I, I spent way too much time babbling about GWAS and didn't have enough time to talk about STAB2, but um, my fault. The um, the stabilin 2 is only really expressed in the sinusoidal endothelium of the liver and the spleen. And oh. so it's very specific. And so um, David's group showed quite nicely that VWF clearance in the l sex is primarily driven by STAB2. Um, does, it, does, um, does the fact that um, mice VWF levels don't vary bother me? Not really. Um, I think that you know there's so many examples of how these receptors operate differently. We showed pretty definitively that if you lose STAB2, your VWF levels are higher. But again, I think what the mice really tells us is that, um, the, the mouse model really tells us is that the, this thing has got pleiotrophic roles. And so it's probably interacting with other ligands in the plasma. I mean, it could be even haluronin that uh, is increased in these people. And, um, that's why they have a VTE risk. What did you sign up after Aaron on purpose? I I totally did. Oh, okay. Well, that was smart. <laughs> yes, and I, it was great to learn new stuff from him yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, no, I my interest is not hampered. Um, and then David Lillicrap pipes in saying the most uh, GWAS signals are in intergenic regions. How often do you think these signals mark important regulatory variants? That's great. So one of the things I, I always want to mention, but I don't, is that what's weird and cool about VTE and VWF genome-wide association studies is that most of the signals are not intergenic. They're actually in haplotype blocks associated with genes that make sense. And you can oftentimes identify the missense variant or a missense variant that's sort of in that allele um, and study it. So that's been super helpful for our field. And that is definitely different than most other areas. And yeah, so I think we need to learn a lot more about the regulatory genome to understand GWAS signals. Um, but we've been relatively lucky in thrombosis and in VWF. Okay, should I keep going? Do I have time? Yeah, why not? Okay, let's do this. Uh, does STAB2 interact additively or synergistically with other genetic or acquired thrombophilias? Great question. And the answer is probably independently, but we really don't have the statistical power yet. So the one one thing that we did look at was um, whether, um, so we had 18% of our uh, VTE cases had factor V life. Um, and then we went and looked and see of the, I think, uh, the people that had a STAB2 variant in that um, cohort, were they more or less likely to have factor V Leiden? 
um, to see if there was any interaction there. And we found that I think 7% of the people with a STAB2 mutation also had a, a Leiden mutation. And so that's increased due, uh, compared to the baseline frequency, which is 2 to 5% in a European population. But it's definitely less than the overall VTE cohort. So there, I think that question needs to be addressed. And I think, you know, obviously finding other epistasis um, uh, it is going to be really fun and in, in, in maybe um, shed some light on some important uh, gene gene interactions. And then Ruben asks, Ruben Beerings in uh, the Netherlands asks, how do you envision polygenic risk scores to become clinically useful? Yeah, um, I think with a lot more data and with an incorporation of our rare variant signals, and I don't know, you know, mathematically, statistically, how they're going to be able to do that. But, you know, so you're envisioning a world where patients have either sequencing data or genotyping data, and we're able to say, based on your genome, here are your risks for all these, you know, common chronic problems. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the, you know, that precision medicine goal, right? Um, and I think polygenic risk scores might be a way to get at it, but I think um, we need yeah, to see. Then, a like, more the ethics comes into play with, like, okay, what do I do with this information? Absolutely, and you know, and if I was speaking to um, a primarily genetics group, this is, uh, you know, something that comes up all the time. Um, in that, you know. Uh, there's lots of ethical concerns um, about how you use genetic data to predict risk. I mean, I'd want to know because I'm crazy, but I think a lot of people wouldn't want to know. Well, here's the, I'm going to sort of flip that coin a little bit and say that, you know, when you have good studies like this, genomic studies, then you can eliminate some, some mistakes that we've made in the past. And so in the, in the field of thrombophilia, um, you know, there's this variant in PI-1 that used to be uh, a very popular test. And some of you may know about this methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase variant. These were <laughs> MTHFR. So these were very common um, variants um, that should be detected in GWAS and absolutely had no signal in, in, in VTE GWAS, suggesting that, you know, the previous studies of it um, were probably statistical false positives. And all those hundreds of thousands of people that we actually genotyped to, and changed the way we manage them based on this information, um, probably we were not making great decisions. And worried for so much. And worried, right, right, right. So um, I, think that, I think that actually speaks to the whole ethical thing here yeah. too. We have to be very careful when we apply um, prediction models to real humans. Real humans. Real humans. I almost feel like if you tell someone they're at risk for something, yes, that's what I was hoping. But you can't, yeah, oh my God. Someone came in. Oh my God. I don't even know what I was say, gonna say. You know, I've always wanted a bulldog. Really? But then I always decide I want a dog and then I go to a shelter and I just take the first Get one. Get a rescue dog, yeah. Yeah, I just take the first one home I see. So. Our boxer was a rescue. We always do rescues and yeah. for some reason, maybe a momentary lapse of reason. We got a backdoor breeder. <laughs> dog. <laughs> but she's pretty sweet. Is she so sweet? She's getting her uterus removed on Friday. Big day. Big day for our little girl. Is she good? She is great. And she's like hilarious. low maintenance? Well, the English bulldog breed, not the healthiest. Yeah. So uh, she's got some airway issues we're also going to address on Friday. <laughs> but um, yeah, such a sweet dog. I always choose like the ones that are super high energy. I don't know why. Cause they have a lot, like, you know, the cattle dogs, those are my two dogs because they have so much personality. I love that. But right. they're complete psychopaths. <laughs> I'd say the boxer doctor? is more of a psychopath, but he's a six now. So it's, it's a lot okay. better than used to. I have a 14 year old. Nice. Yeah. I got him the summer before starting in Alyssa's lab. Oh, so. yeah. It marks time, doesn't it? Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for that. That puppy yeah. case. Oh my God. I'm surprised yeah. she didn't hop up on me while I was talking. <laughs> this was really, really great. Um, I'll send you the rest of the questions. And um, yeah, thanks thank for, you. for joining us. It's been my oh, pleasure. I just remembered that I opened up more trainee slots. 
because uh, I'll be here through June. Um, so if anyone's still on and wants to sign up, I'll probably put it on Twitter or something, but you heard it here first. There's six more slots open if people want to sign up for that. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks, Carl. And You're welcome. Uh, Thank you. See you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.